not live. Okay, so this is class eight, and last time we talked about RS-232 communications protocol, 232, 232, and we talked about analog to digital converters. And um, move this out of the way. The uh, so we probably should have talked about our RS two thirty two is a form of a serial protocol, one bit at a time. Tink tink tink. I said a one a zero one zero 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 one 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 zero zero zero. The other end picks it up, reorders it, uh, takes it and puts it into formats back into bytes from bits. Um, RS-232 specifically is big voltage, well, as far as chips go, big voltage levels. Um, a 1 is greater than 5 volts. Actually, I think it's greater than 3 volts. And a 0 is uh, less than negative 3 volts. Most of the time, what you see here on this little guy, on, on, on your Arduino, on these pins that say TX that way and RX this way, uh, that's 5 volt logic, not RS-232. We call it RS-232, RS-232, because we use the same signaling protocol, which is one start bit. It's a start bit. It is between, it's either 5 and 9 or 6 to 9, I don't remember, data bits. Uh, and then 0 or 1 parity bit, and then 1, 1 and a half, or 2 stop bits. And the question was asked last time, one and a half bits? What the heck? One and a half bits is, it's all just timing. Uh, back in the bad old days when people were making these originally, some systems follow the specs a little bit more closely than other systems. And when you would try to make this system play with that system, one stop bit wasn't enough, two was more than enough. So they jiggled the timing a little bit to give you one and a half stop bits. Um, and all that is is time to recover. So an RS-232 system is, is uh, free-running clocks, but you have to sync. So what you do is, and I might have the levels inverted, but you know, I'll do it. I'll do it in CMOS logic. I come in and I go from zero volts to five volts, and that's a start bit. And then I have my data bits happening here. So that could be a high, that could be a high. And in the worst case, they're all highs. You're sending, a, you're sending a bunch of ones. So this just becomes one big long block of ones. And then you have um, the stop bit is low, if I remember right. So a start bit is high. And I might have this wrong. You can read it up on Wikipedia or whatever. It's correct there. Stop bit is low, and the stop bit is to ensure that you have a low time between because the, clock, the internal clock on the receiver sinks on this first edge. And it says there's an edge, 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 edge. But if I go and this whole thing is a long one, it says, well, my time is this, so I should sample in the middle, in the middle, and I might start to drift. And if you look at the worst case timings, that's the longest you can go in that amount of time and still maintain sync on your bits. So that's why they do it that way. When you come to, I guess this is actually backwards, that'd be a zero and that'd be a one. When you come to true RS-32 where you're putting the high voltage levels, you're, you start here and your start bit goes low and then your bits come out whatever they are here. So a negative voltage is a 1, a positive voltage is a 0. And the reason they have this gap in the side in between these two is to is noise immunity. So if there's noise out here, we showed we showed some of this before with 
your nights, lights are putting 60 cycles out all over the place. You have all sorts of trash in here. Just make sure you're outside of the trash. That's all it's for. Artist 232 is good for a fairly long way. Um, you can go a couple hundred yards on RS-32, RS-232. There's also RS-422, RS-485 that are very similar. And I think with RS-485 you can get a couple miles. Um, so, practically speaking, for us, on our Arduino, we have our CPU, which is a AT Mega... 328p and it has two pins that are the RS-232 uh, communications module inside of it and it comes to a chip made by FTDI and I don't remember what FTDI stands for but this is a that's a sign for a twisted pair USB to RS-232 bridge. So it takes your USB, turns your USB into RS, it takes the USB signals and actually turns them into CMOS signaling 8 in 1. And in your Arduino sketch, you can turn on your serial monitor and then you can actually talk through this thing. So that's kind of what's going on here right now is I set uh, the homework was to take the ADCs and I don't have my glasses on so that looks blurry. I don't know if it really is or not. We talked about ADCs last time and I'm going to play around here. So we've got on our Arduino we've got six ADC channels, A0 through A5. And I'm just taking A0 is equal to this, A1 is equal to that, A2, A3, A4, A5. And we talked about how the multiplexing works and how it creates, a you see the time constant? So right here you see A0 is hooked up on mine right now to the 3.3 volt output and that's 667, so my maximum count should be 1,024. So the way to figure out what it should be is, uh, what's the word USB? Um, it's two to the 10th minus one is equal to uh, 1,023 is the max count and it's 1,024, but you include zero as one of the counts. So it's zero to 1,023. And I've set the reference at five volts. So I have 1,000, I have my VREF divided by 1,024 but recognizing you start at zero, so 1,023 is actually in any way, um, is the volts per count. So I've got um, five volt reference set in over 1,020. I'll use 1,023. That's better. And where's my... I'm just looking for my phone so I can do math. <laughs> I think that's like four microvolts, but... Um, Five divided by 1,024 equals oh, four millivolts. 4.88 millivolts. And the, the way you say this is that's per count, CT, or per LSB, least significant bit. So that tells me that the bottom bit, this is represented as... 10 bits, 0 through 9. This bit here is worth 4.88 millivolts. I've hooked up to 3.3 to it, so I multiply times 3.3. Well, that ain't right. 5 
divided by a thousand. Six fifty five is what you get output wise from the analog. Yeah. So uh, it's three fifths. So volts per count, counts per volt. I'm sorry. We can turn this around the other way, right, and say um, it's uh, five volts per a thousand twenty three counts, millivolts per count. So if I want to know how many counts, I take three point three and divide by 4.88 millivolts volts per count, puts that up into the numerator count, and so there we go. 3.3 divided by 0 .00488, 676 counts. So I expect 3.3 volts should be somewhere around 676. Give or take offsets, I see 667. And I get 655. And that's the difference from chip to chip to chip. My voltage regulator might not be putting out exactly 3.3. Yours might not either. My reference might not be exactly 5. Neither may yours. Slop. Slop happens. So that's the quick math of how that works. Um, so what we talked about before was the way these things work is a multiplexer. So in, a, in the ideal world, an analog to digital converter... analog in, uh, in this case 10 bits, digital out. Um, the input of these is very heavily capacitive. And so we talked about capacitors in the first couple classes. They store charge. The way an analog to digital converter works is you take in some charge, you take your voltage in here, you charge this capacitor, you play games, you figure out what the charge is, and that's how you figure out the counts. Anytime, I'm not going to go through all the math, but there's a thing called a time constant. Time constant, uh, tau, is equal to R times C. That's C, and whatever resistance we've got here is R. If you have a signal, this is zero volts and this is Vmax, whatever it is, the time to charge from zero, if I put in a step, if I, if I put in a big square wave here, my, if I put this in as my input, what I will see is this. The point where that is 98.7%, I think, basically 99%, is 5 tau, 5 RC. And you can go through the math and prove that. I've done it. It's not fun. <laughs> um, is that a constant? So I can't tell you what the capacitive input of that analog to digital converter is. Okay. It is some number. It is in picofarads times 10 oh, micro nano pico times 10 to the negative 12 farads. Okay. So this is usually times 10 to the negative 12th. This is probably on the order of 300 or so. So that gives me, yeah, and that's probably, uh, I'll call it 1 times 10 to the negative 12th. So that's going to give me tau is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 10, actually 3 times 10 to the negative 10-ish. Uh, but 5 of those is going to be uh, 1.5 nanoseconds. Okay. So, and that's very clearly wrong. That's probably closer to millimicro nano. It's probably nanos. So that'd be 9 and that would make that six, so now we're closer to one and a half microseconds. So it takes some time to charge it, and it takes some time to discharge it, because there's an R and a C there. R resists the flow of the current. The capacitor's a big water balloon there, just wanting to take the charge. So anytime you do a good um, 
analog to digital conversion circuit you want to drive that input. You'll have an amplifier out here in the front that can drive the heck out of that. He can push amps there if he wants to, to be able to overcome that RC to make sure it goes where you want it to go. We're not doing that. The way these multiplexers work is you have some basically a switch and you've got an input, a whole bunch of inputs and they all come together together. So all of these come together and they come here to this capacitor that's inside the analog to digital converter. That's supposed to be an integral, that's what that's supposed to look like. Um, so if I've got 5 volts sitting here, or actually I've got 3.3 volts, right? 3.3 volts. I close this switch, I let 3.3 volts in, I get my 600 and 67 and now I go to this one so I open this switch up and I close this switch but it's hanging open there's nothing there right I'm like I didn't put anything I didn't put anything on that so this charge didn't go away I opened this first and then I closed that and this is for all intents and purposes infinity so that charge doesn't go away. The only way that charge goes away is through the sampling modes in here and some leakages other place. And so we see on the second one of mine, it's not 667, it's 658. So it's, you know, a little bit of charge is leaked out, but it's still seeing close to 3.2 volts there. And, and then the next one, I did the same thing. I just left it open. And we see that it's, sitting at 649 on mine and then the last one I tied up to 5 volts and it gives me 1023 like it should and then the so channel 0 is at 3.3 open open 5 volts open but then I've tied it to ground and it's a zero so that was what I was talking about last time if you're doing switching back and forth Probably the best way to do this is to only do one, but if you need to switch back and forth between two, tie one to ground, and then you can switch to this one and then go back. Because what happens in this case, I'm not driving this, so if I've got the 3.3 here, but here I've got a temperature sensor. Um, now what happens is in the time that I do this, I pre-charge that, and then I turn this one on, and this could be a fairly high impedance load. And whatever's left in here is going to affect my reading. So I'm not going to get a true reading. And so here I can come back to a known constant, come back to zero, and come back to here. And that way I don't, I'm not trying to backfeed my temperature sensor with any charge that's left. Understand? Does that make sense? Greek? Yeah, and it's, I mean, this, this thing's going all over the place, except for the ones that I've you know, tied somewhere. Tied somewhere, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what's going on. Okay, so RS-232, practically speaking, in code for the Arduino. Um, if you're using the Arduino kit, uh, Serial is a uh, preloaded uh, C++ function, uh, class that's in there. And when you want to start it up, you say serial dot. So serial is the class. The method is begin. I think it's lowercase. Yep. And then you put in your VOD. And I think you can actually put in parity bits, stop bits. I think, I think you can. All that stuff. I've never actually used it. So, because nobody, I. I can't remember the last time I've actually used parity bits. Well, parity bits are error detection. If you've got a no the 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 path through which you transmit your data is called your channel. If you have a noisy channel, then 
you might want to use parity bits. Can I read that up there? I can barely read that up there. So the way the parity bits works, you can have odd parity and you can have even parity. And so N E and O in 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 uh, Arduino land. He's saying none, even is any and odd. None, odd, even. Yeah. Yeah, so none. Those are your choices. And the way it works is I've got eight bit we'll say eight bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If it's odd parity, it wants to make this parity bit uh, a one. So I might have this wrong. It's been a long time because I don't I haven't used parity bits in years. Um, but let's say zero one one zero zero one one zero. That's one, two, three, four. If I'm doing odd parity, then that's a zero because I've got an even number of bits. If it's even parity, then that's a one because I've got an even number of bits. And so I look at it on the back end as it comes through and I say, oh, I, I have a parity bit. Is it the right? Do I have an even number of? Yes, I do. Okay, well, probably my data is okay. There's a bunch of other clever ways like Reed Solomon encoding that's used in cell phones where they can do not only error detection but also error correction uh, basic, based on statistics of how noise works. Hard drives. Uh, do they use Reed Solomon? Well, I don't know if it's that, that exact one, but they do the same sort of thing where they, they detect the error and correct it. So what happens in noise, if, if I look at time, what happens is there's a little bit of noise and I get a burst, like a lightning bolt. Remember AM radios? Lightning goes like a It happens, right? So FM radios are pretty immune to it, but AM you hear it. So what happens is it's generally just one or two bits that'll get dorked up here in the middle of this because you're zipping them through. So what they do, with, I think it's Reed Solomon, is you take your bits in this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you do your words, so the first word, so this is word one, two, three, down, and so zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, you know, so on and so forth. But then what, you, and so then you do compute your parity here, and you compute parity here. So you have parity this way, and then you have parity that way. And now when I ship them out the door, I put them into my buffer this way, I actually ship them out that way. So it mixes all the bits up. They're all mixed up and, and, and the bits aren't in order. That way if I get a noise, it doesn't mess up two consecutive bits. That would have been two consecutive bits because that's hard to fix. But if I get a noise and say this parity and that parity, they, you know, they, make a, they make a grid, they'll both be wrong. And I can say, oh, that bit was wrong. I can change that bit back and I don't have to resend the transmission. Clever. There's a lot of people who are a lot more clever than me. <laughs> I, I probably never would have come up on, with that on my own, right? I said, oh, hey, that's cool. And then we talked about all the different ways to serial.write, serial.read, serial.this, serial.that, how to send stuff out the door. That was last week. I've just beaten it to death. <laughs> so, serial is a two-wire interface, but it's bi-directional. So, serial has a TX here, RX in, TX out, and over here is a TX out, coming back to an RX in. Which, by the way, is very handy when you're troubleshooting and you're writing your first code. Because you can just loop it right back around on itself and you can send something out the door and see that you got exactly what you sent out. Right? Great troubleshooting. Yeah, I did, did that with DS3s today. So, 
This is this is RS-232 and uh, CMOS serial. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is SPI. SPI. So this is what we call bidirectional, or full duplex, full duplex. That means I can send and receive at the same time. Okay. SPI is serial peripheral per if for all. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Interface. SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. Inside that chip is an SPI, called SPI, is an SPI module. SPI is a three wire interface. You have MOSI, Master Out Slave In. I should probably write that out. <laughs> The problem is my I got this old piece of crap camera and you can't see half this stuff yeah. when you get to look at it. So so if I say it enough times while I'm writing it, maybe somebody on the other end will get it. Master out slave in. So that tells you you have a master and a slave system. Then you have so master out slave in comes out. This is data. And it goes into MISO. And guess what MISO stands for? Master and Slave Out. Yes. I'm just kidding. What was it? MISO goes into Master and Slave Out. Yes. And then you'll have another MOSI here. And you'll have another MISO here. So, again, this is full duplex. Because that goes out as that comes in. But there's a third wire. It is clock. So in RS-232, I don't send a clock. I have a clock that's merrily running over here, and I have a clock that's merrily over here, and they're asynchronous from each other. They are not synchronized. They are asynchronous. And so those clocks can walk off of each other. You know, you want them to be here all the time, but the truth is, just like we have different voltages, Different voltage equals different clock. Different temperature equals different clock. Different clock equals different clock. Different gamma rays coming in at any given point in time equals different clock. Um, the fact that you put your hand somewhere close it and you're changing some capacitance in there somewhere, it's a slightly different clock. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking out the clock uncertainty. I'm giving you a clock. Clock always comes from the master. Master comes out. And then you can play games uh, with chip select. They have you use what's called a chip select line, and you can choose this chip versus this chip versus that chip. But it's an 8-bit protocol, and you go in and you set it up in the. You, you you write to it and you tell it go, and it pukes those 8 bits out. And the way it works internally is kind of clever. Um, here you have an 8-bit register. And here you have an 8-bit register. And this is MOSI. And this is MISO. And then it just loops right back around like that. And so there's your MOSI. And here's your MISO. And this guy supplies the clock. So clock comes in, he runs that guy, and he comes all the way over here and he runs that guy. Clock in. Now, on the master, I put eight bits here, and I send it through, and it lands there. And now the slave got his command to do something. Oh, go get this piece of memory. And he, and now he puts it there, and now the master says, okay, let's do something again, and he sends his 8 bits out. And when he sends his 8 bits out, the answer 8 bits come right back. So you're like off by one.
you send a command, and then the next time you send a command, you get the data back, unless you do a specific read. But it lets you do a transmit and receive of the same time, and it optimizes registers down to one. Whereas RS-232 uses like five or six different registers to do the job. Right. So that's how the BME 280 uh, pressure humidity uh, temperature sensor that I have used works. If you say so. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, is it that one? I was going to look at this this week and I forgot. I think it's this connector right here, this little six pin connector on the Arduino. That's an SPI connector. Now, the Arduino chips, the, the, the AT Tiny, or the whole AT, Atmel AT series, as far as I know, AT Tinies, AT Megas, and I think there's another one, they're programmable via SPI. And so they give you data. They give you meso, mosi, clock, uh, five volts, and ground. And then the other pin is maybe also a ground or not used or something like that. So they're supplying power, bidirectional data. And you can, in the, if you look at your options in the Arduino IDE for programming, you don't have to go through the serial port to program. You can go through an external programmer and program that directly. So the way, the way that the Arduino works, they take that chip, the, the microcontroller, and it has a certain section of flash RAM in it. If you, if you look at it, we talked about program counters and pointers and, and, and where you're looking in RAM or ROM. They have a section of the read-only of the flash, flash RAM. I'm going to consider it a ROM for this. There's some section of it that's called bootloader. And it's constantly watching for... The Arduino, it's, it's constantly watching the RS-232 port for a series of instructions. And when it sees those series of instructions, it's a flag that says, I'm going to write new code here. So when you download a program, when, when you're using the Arduino IDE and you say, upload, upload it comes here, this bootloader, it, this... You're, you, you send a command down, there's actually some other chips on here that look for that and say, oh, we're going into programming mode now. And the bootloader says, okay, we load it all right here. And if you ever go in and program this directly <coughs> using the, the SPI port, you'll blow away the bootloader. And then you won't be able to program it from the US, the, over the USB link anymore. You'll have to go download the bootloader code and reburn the bootloader. I've done that. It's doable. But you need an external programmer to do that. You can't do it over the, over the USB line. And, and, and unless, you, unless you want to go get the parts and the kits and make your own, I think you got to go buy one. Can, can you use another Arduino? Some people have done it. I think there, there's thinking. ways to do it. I don't know what they are. I've never done it that way. I actually I, I got into the AT the Atmel chips pre Arduino, and I have two or three old programming Program. devices at home, so I can just sit down and program them. Um, I don't know what they use now because that's been obsolete for a couple years. I I don't know what they use. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is I2C, um, or I squared C. It's, uh, I don't remember what it stands for. Integrated circuit interface. I don't remember. It works a little bit differently. You have I think it's a two wire interface. 
phi to C, which is actually, if, if I remember right, it's actually I squared C, so I, I, C. Um, you've got a line for data and a line for ground. And so ground connects the two boards together. And you do bi-directional data on the data line. So it's half duplex. You can send data or you can receive data. You can't do both at the same time. And the way it works, uh, you have to have a pull up, I think. And it's an open collector. So on each end, you've got this. So this is an inverter. I don't know that it's actually an inverter. It might just be a buffer. But so if I pull that up to 5 volts, that's a high, which would normally cons be considered a 1. So coming out here, I've got a 0. And, and this will feed a this will feed a register. And I've got some detection circuitry out here. So I look at this, and I have to tell it somewhere how fast I'm going to do things. Um, and it'll look, and if it doesn't see a change on this bus in a certain amount of time, it assumes the bus is dead and it'll start to transmit, and it'll transmit here. If I put a one on here, that turns this switch on, which pulls this down to ground. And then out this end, this went to ground, I see a one. I just saw an edge change. Oh, something's going on, the bus is busy, I should be listening. And now I sit here, twiddle this guy, and that guy starts receiving data. If, when this guy gets done, he waits some amount of time, now the guy on the other end can say, oh, okay, you told me to do something, here's your data back. And he does the same thing. He, he sits here and he waits until this is dead for a certain amount of time. Then he twiddles this guy and pulls it down to ground and, and the data comes back this way. Back and forth, back and forth. It's a, it's a speak acknowledge type thing. And um, you can hook many things up on this. Um, you can daisy chain them in certain ways. Uh, so usually the way it works is they send an address and a command and every chip has its own address. Now, we, you know, we, we, we've already gone over some things, being able to talk back to your computer. Um, there are some other nifty things, and if you have one, I'll encourage you to do this for homework. I'll, I bought, bought a couple the other day, so I'll do it to demonstrate. But where this comes in handy for the makers is both I2C and SPI, if I look at my, my Arduino, I've got 13, and if I use the analogs, I've got at most, what, 19 I.O.? So I've, I've got about 20 digital I.O. I can use if I'm not using the analog to digital converters. There's a thing called a bus expander, or a, or a pin expander. And so what I can do is I can hook my SPI or my I2C up off of the Arduino, oh, it's called an Uno, off the Uno, even though it could be a Duo or a Yin or whatever. And I'll use SPI or I2C, and I'll come out to a bus expander chip. And they usually have eight digital I.O. on them. And now I can talk over this thing and tell him, I want you to set this bit up as an input and that one as an output and whatever else. And I can keep using the same thing. And instead of having to stack up 10 Arduinos to get 40 I.O., I can just stick a couple of these out here and I can get a whole bunch of I.O. really quick. I guess the limit is that there's a, the limit of how many is the speed of, of, of the SPI or the I2C as far as how, how many times it can go around and grab all that stuff and stuff it back in. 
Sure, but I mean, digital I/O is usually slow compared to your processor speed, right? Yeah, you, you are going to take a hit on on I/O speed to do it. You have to. I mean, the the I/O speed inside uh, it's a 16 megahertz clock. Uh, I've got a friend who's really he's an amazing programmer. Um, he can do things in like two clock cycles. He can recognize that you did something and start up doing something else inside of two clock cycles. As soon as I do this and I put on a bus expander, now I've got to wait at least eight clock cycles. I have to go out and tell it to do something and then I have to go out and query it every now and then. But the way they work, once you set them up, I say there's like a, it's sort of like three bytes. There's a, you send an address You send an, I have to go back and look at the data sheet on this before I do it, but you send an address, and one address is, is tells you, if I send it, I send an address, and that sets up the register, and I say, okay, this register is this. So that's an input, output, input, output, input, input, output, and then, then when I send it in to this other address, um, anything that's in here goes straight out of the outputs or inputs, whichever, goes straight out to the pins, and anything that's here gets latched into this other address and reads back. So I, it ta I think it takes a couple steps. You've got to say, set it up, and now you say, write, read, write, read, write, read, and, and things come back and forth. So you're taking a big hit in speed, but you're gaining a lot of I.O. I.O., yeah. So I'll code one of those up for next time, and that'll be next week's homework if you happen to have a bus expander chip. I think I bought four of them. They're like a buck fifty each at, at DigiKey. The problem with going to DigiKey is the shipping's ten bucks minimum or fifteen bucks minimum. So don't go buy stuff just for this. If you've got other things, pack up a hundred dollars worth of stuff and yeah. buy it all at once. Um. I think that's most of the class for tonight. I mean, talking about SPI and I2C was all I really wanted to hit tonight. I've got other things in the in the in the can for the next couple weeks. So next week I'll demo a a little bus expander, and that's it. Cool. Short class tonight. Shoot, an hour. It's a record. Sweet. Now now we can talk about your stuff about cutting off power lines and watching the mark. <laughs> well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> All right. Should I leave this running so we get a refresher on AC, or should I go ahead and turn it off? I'll go ahead and turn it off. Everybody can go back to the first two classes, I guess. Let's see. Put